Friends, will you please pray with me? God of all people, who is present among the lowly, draw us in this morning. Lord, we know our minds are cloudy with a hundred different thoughts, but we pray for some clarity to enter our thoughts, that we can be led by your presence, that we can hear your voice and reflect in your name. Amen. In his first year in seminary, Jim Wallace, um, he is the founder of the religious political publication Sojourners and has done many, many years of advocacy, advocacy work. In his first year in seminary, Jim and a bunch of his friends went about the task, the thorough study of finding every verse in the Bible that deals with the poor or social injustice. And I'm thankful for his word, but I imagine it was a spiritual process, but I'm glad I can just Google that now. But in going through it, they came up with thousands, thousands of verses. In the first three Gospels, one out of ten verses dealt with social justice or the poor. In the Gospel of Luke, it was one out of seven. One of them found an old Bible and began to cut out every single Bible verse that dealt with the poor. Much of the Psalms and the prophets disappeared. That old Bible would hardly hold itself together. They had created a Bible full of holes. While it still has this holy Bible all these years later, and it dramatically shows what the Jewish and Christian scriptures would look like if we decided that social justice wasn't a part of our beliefs, or the large holes that would appear in our faith if we decided how we think about money and wealth and power was not a part of our religion. So guess what? We are reflecting on everyone's most comfortable topic this morning, money and wealth. <laughs> because it comes to us in our lectionary today, one of those texts. And I encourage you to stick with me even if you are feeling uncomfortable. James says in our verse that, Dear brothers and sisters, dear siblings, God has, hasn't God chosen those who are poor by worldly standards to be rich in faith? Hasn't God chosen the poor as heirs of the kingdom, but you, you dishonor the poor? James sees in his people a problem, this tendency to cater to, to prefer, to seek the counsel of, to say that their wisdom is superior, that their experiences are the most important, to give special treatment to the wealthy and the powerful in their society. The scenario that he lifts up in our text is one of the church people, of the church people giving rich preferred treatment. Of telling them, come here, sit in these nice places. And to the poor, and to the poor, he says, we insult and tell them to stand by themselves, to sit at the feet. This is what the world did, and friends, this is what our world does. That we prioritize the rich, that we do not seek the knowledge, the gifts, the wisdom of the poor that we do not create a society that is easier for them to access. James, throughout his book, is consistent in his appeal that no one can be friends with the world and with God. To show this partiality or favoritism, it places us at odds with God. That human freedom, it comes about when we are of one mind that is wholly a friend of God and only seeking, and only seeking to practice what we profess as followers of Christ. I find it both hopeless and heartening, and I'm not sure which is more, when we connect the struggles of 2,000 years ago to the exact same things that we continue to struggle against today. 
I feel in all ways that our society and a culture, it still does everything in our power to cater to, to prefer the ways that the rich and powerful live out their lives, to follow in their path and place blame upon everyone else. On this Labor Day weekend, on this Labor Day weekend, a holiday which I learned this week, that as the president was declaring Labor Day weekend a federal holiday at the same time, he was sending National Guard to break up a, a labor strike going on in Chicago. That at one time celebrating labors, he is also breaking down a train worker's strike, killing and wounding and arresting people. A strike that was fighting for fair and just working conditions for the working poor. And a strike that while doing this for the working poor, they were excluding black workers from that same fight. Because as we know and as we see, that partiality continues down in all places. And on this Labor Day weekend, we know that these battles of equality are constant. Historian Dr. Harutika Ward speaks of the Christian Reformation, this time of enlightenment where our tradition comes from, while European Christians fought over doctrines of faith at the same time they exploited the poor, they exploited world markets for luxury goods, they established unequal treaties with Asian nations, they obtained massive American lands by force and stole millions of la or they stole free labor from millions of Africans. I think about the way we continue to steal labor today with unjust working conditions and wages people cannot live on. Getting an undocumented immigrant to do your work for tiny wages sure is a good deal, but there is no God and there is no faith there. Just a partiality for the rich, for more. I've never been able to understand the humanity of being a CEO of a billion-dollar corporation and bringing in millions, if not billions, of dollars and not being willing to pay employees, all employees, no matter what they are doing, a living wage, let alone a thriving one. I just don't understand how we can reconcile our humanity with that. That how can wealthy, powerful Christians live lovingly and justly when God's children live poor and destitute lives? And for me, I think that's a very easy question in this place to answer as a role as a billionaire CEO. From my perspective, that is fair and easy for me to do, but it's much more troubling and it shakes me. And breaks me to answer that question as my own self. With my own wealth and privilege and understanding, with my own constant partiality that stands in stark contrast of a common humanity, this partiality that we show, that I show every minute of most days. And I know with our access, and in moving forward, that we are often, we are called in, into giving, yet what we see, that even if we look at philanthropy itself, that too struggles with this preference for the rich, that often, as we see in our country and in our society, that philanthropy operates with the same top-down structures that show partiality to those in power, that at its worst, not in all cases, but at its worst, philanthropy can, philanthropy can look like the wealthy and powerful paying middle-class people to figure out how to distribute funds to poor people. That so much of the money meant for the poor ends up being diluted by other channels before it gets to them. And the questions that we ask are ones of partiality that is that because that those in power that we, that we do not trust the poor to sort out how to best meet their needs how to best meet the needs of their own communities and the places that they're living in, that their wisdom and that their humanity is not trusted here. 
that the poor, that the other, that those without power, that those in the minority, that they are constantly being othered through top-down relationships. And as I say these things, it is a reminder, my friends, that first and foremost, I am always preaching to myself and my struggles. Because within this, within this society that we continually to create, that we are left with partiality for one type of living and thinking. I see how we struggle with this, how I struggle with this in our day-to-day living beyond rich and poor, whether it is how to act, how to dress, how to identify oneself, what pronouns to use, how we trust, who we trust, how we spend our money, that often and continually we prefer partiality, that we demand a consensus on a right way to do things. And we, of course, as a church, we know that we are no different. We might not make someone sit on the floor or at someone's feet, but do we include the other, the poor, in real and authentic ways? Do they just get invited to coffee hour and not to the party? Do we seek their counsel? Do we call upon them? I know that often and always I fall short. We as a church people, we claim that there is a right way to worship, a right way to dress, a right way to sit, a right way to sing, a right way to participate, a right time to speak. Reverend Nicola Torbert writes that if privilege separates those who possess it from the reign of love because they, because we, do not need to ask for help or search for miracles popping up from the earth like mushrooms or join with others to quilt together whole new ways of being communal, of having communal needs met. What if God and the poor know that the world is so much more inventive and mutable mutable than her habitual transactional ways permit us to know? What if so much more life is possible right now, only if we are willing to divest in whatever obscures that reality and join in with others at the ground floor? James calls upon Christians in the scripture to show no partiality. He calls us to merge our differing self-understandings into this new and enlarged and richer unity of identity as faithful followers of Christ. Our God, this God that we talk about in the Bible, this God that shows up in that holy Bible, This God does not dream of our independence, of uniformity, of this top-down way of creating relationships, of telling others what to do and what is best for them. Our God does not dream that we pretend that we are so complete, that we do not need any help and that we are fine on our own. Our God does not dream of our self-sufficiency, of bootstraps that we can pull ourselves up by. God's vision, God's vision of this community, of communities, of our world is one of interdependence, of this web so connected, so intertwined that we cannot move without shaking the person across the street, on the other side, on the people next to us. That God's vision, that God's vision and understanding and hope for us is this one of ground-up flourishing. We are called to build that kingdom, that kingdom that is yet to be. Because that is the type of community that offers so much more for us than we can possibly imagine. And beloved... We are called to start that here. We are called not to be overwhelmed by the world, but to start in our own lives, to start in our church, in our families, and in our cities. 
And I give thanks for the people doing this work. I give thanks for you all who are already doing this work. I give thanks for the ways, big and small, that we have been there. I give thanks for all the people who have stayed despite not being in the in crowd. I give thanks for the people who think differently from this church and yet who have stayed who have different theologies and different ideologies, for guests who have remained even when they weren't included, for youth who come and sit in worship even though our language and structure isn't always geared to make them feel engaged. I give thanks for members who have stayed for 60 plus years even when there have been so many times when they should have left. I give thanks for our black and members and people of color in our pews who have remained even when they have been alienated. I give thanks for people whose bodies tell them that they want to walk around during worship but get looks for doing so. I give thanks for people who have dressed down on Sundays, making others who couldn't dress up more comfortable. For our truth is, What we know to be true, if we are honest with ourselves, is that we are all people who do not fit in. And God's vision is exactly that. That we can find the strength and the power and the insight and perhaps weave ourselves together in a way. Weave ourselves together in a way despite ourselves, but for the betterment of ourselves from the ground up, bringing one another into this world, into community, and creating this web of mutual aid and interdependence. For this type of nonconformity is far grander for us and far greater. So we ask, how do we stitch everyone into our community, into the fabric of our church, and not merely receive them. Amen.